Good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. I was talking to someone yesterday, and, so, and they said, when do you stop saying Happy New Year? But uh, Happy New Year to everybody. My name is Paige Rivard. I'm the CEO of PWSA, and I also have a son, Jake, who is 12, uh, living with PWS. So I'd like to welcome everyone to our first ever Behavior Summit. We're so excited. Um, we have four sessions today running from 2 p.m. to 7.45, I believe, Eastern Time. Um, we'll be hearing from some amazing speakers who are experts in their fields and behavior. So um, you will hear about the ABCs of behavior, tools to help prevent and manage challenging behaviors, and so much more. Um, as I mentioned, my son is 12, and like you, I'm sure I've experienced behavior issues at one time or another throughout our PS, PWS journey. And I think we can all use tips and tricks for those who are experts or from those who are experts um, in the field, as well as hopefully just learn from each other. So we are thrilled to offer this webinar series to you today, and we hope that you find some nuggets of information that will benefit you and your family. Um, our first presenter today is our very own Stacy Ward. Stacy is our Director of Family Support, and Stacy works remotely for PWSA from her home in Troy, New York. So welcome, Stacy. Thank you, Pat. Uh, prior to joining PWSA, just to give you a little bit of background about Stacy, um, she was staff. Um, she, she joined us in 2016, but prior to that, she was the Associate Director for a residential living um, nonprofit in Al Albany, New York, that specialized in supporting individuals diagnosed with PWS. Stacy has a master's degree in psychology, applied behavior analysis, and a certification in special ed advocacy. And I think many of you have worked with Stacy and her team who are here to support our PWS community in so many ways, um, including this last year, Stacy and her team did a lot of education and training for schools. Um, from IEPs to behavioral issues. They also did a lot of training in residential homes and um, so much more. So Stacy has a lot of experience in PWS and um, education and behavior. And Stacy, thank you for presenting today. And I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right. Thanks, Paige. I appreciate that. Um, very, very nice introduction. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I saw a couple questions in the Q&A. So uh, for, yes, we are going to be recording this. And we are also, um, we disabled the chat function and you guys are automatically muted. So you can ask questions in the Q&A. At the end, we do have time to answer those questions. Uh, Paige will be helping me manage that throughout this presentation. Um, so we will get started. Okay, can you guys see my presentation as a full screen? Stacy, I'm not able to see, it says you're sharing your screen, but I'm not able to see your presentation yet. Okay, on my end, it says it's still loading. Just one second, I'm gonna stop and try again. I wonder if it's just large and taking a little bit of time. Still loading. I'm so sorry for that. While well, Stacy's presentation is still loading, I just I wanted to say we again um, right now we have about 116 participants. So great turnout. Thank you guys all for um, showing up this afternoon. And I know that there will be a lot of questions around behavior and things that we might not answer today. But please, at any time. Um, you know, after this presentation today, if you want to reach out to us, you can reach out at info at PWSAUSA.org, and we will help answer questions, connect you with um, other experts, but feel free to reach out to us at any time. So, all right, Stacey, it looks like you got it loaded, so I'll let you know. Thank you. Um, and as Paige mentioned, yes, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I did include the contact information at the end of this presentation. 
for you guys. Um, so today, my part of today's behavior summit is to kind of give you guys a very brief overview of behavior, some quick and easy things that we can do at home. Uh, so the, first, the objectives for today is first to discuss what is behavior? How do we define that? What are the functions of behavior? And what that means is, why is the behavior happening? And then just the ABCs of behavior. So what is behavior? Behavior is defined in the behavior world as anything a person says or does. Can it pass the dead man's test? And what that means is if a dead man can do it, it's not behavior. So if you are concerned that your child is being told he's non-compliant at school, a dead man can be non-compliant. That's not a behavior. We need to define that. Behavior is observable and measurable. So when we use the terms non-compliant, how do you observe that? How do you measure that? What does that look like? So when we say what does behavior look like, we mean if what I'm doing right now, I'm talking. That looks like my lips are moving, my tongue is moving. You can count the words that I'm saying. You can count how fast I'm speaking or how slowly. Um, that's all behavior. Like I mentioned, things like non-compliance or anxiety, those are not behaviors. Um, and we're going to talk more about those two specific examples a little bit later in the presentation. So behavior is not good or bad. It's neutral. What it is, though, is socially significant. And what that means is when we talk about changing behavior, we are going to change the behaviors that affect somebody's quality of life. And we measure that by the effect that behavior has on the environment. So if me talking right now has no detrimental or negative effect on the environment, that's not something we're going to worry about. If I am running out into traffic, that has a big effect on the environment. Um, cars may get into accidents. They may be slamming on their brakes. I may get hit, that sort of thing. And I think it's important to remember that we all engage in behavior that might negatively affect the environment all the time. But the difference is when our children do these things or our students or the people that we support, we look at that differently than it, when we're engaging in this kind of behavior. And I like to use road rage as an example. Um, as Paige mentioned, I live in New York, so there is lots of road rage here. But let's say I am driving to my office and I am running 10 minutes late and the car in front of me is going about 10 miles under the speed limit. How do I respond to that? If I start laying on my horn, yelling and swearing, even though I know the driver in front of me can't hear me, or I start tailgating them, flashing my lights, that's all negative behavior. It's all inappropriate. It has the potential to have a very negative effect on the environment. But there's nobody with me telling me that's inappropriate or I need to change my behavior. However, if it was our children as we were teaching them how to drive, we would be saying those things. If it was somebody that we're supporting, we would be pointing out all of the things that they're doing that are inappropriate or don't meet our standards. So one of the things that I, I really like to preface and remind people to do is take a step back when we start criticizing or pointing out other people's behavior. And remember that we all engage in behavior. And for many of us, nobody's telling us just how inappropriate that, that is. Now, behavior happens for a reason. Uh, it doesn't occur in a, a vacuum. And those reasons are the functions of behavior. There's four of them. The first one is escape. The second is attention. The third is tangible or access to items. And the fourth is sensory. So for those of you who are uh, participating today who are parents of children with Prader-Willi syndrome, you know that sensory is something that many of the kids are seeking um, and can very often be the reason that they're engaging in certain behavior. So let's talk about escape first. What does that look like? 
So escape is when a person behaves in a certain way to get out of doing something or to avoid doing something that they don't want to do. Um, an example of that is when a child yells no and runs off to their bedroom when they're asked to put their toys away. And then they're no longer required to put their toys away and mom does it instead. What that child has just learned is that yelling no and running off will get them out of having to put those things away and increase the likelihood that they're going to engage in that same behavior again. Attention, um, this is one thing that, uh, or cause of behavior that we see people automatically say, oh, they're doing it for attention, they're attention seeking. Um, and in some cases that that is true, but it's not always about attention. And it's important that we really look at these different functions. We can't address behavior and help change or modify somebody's behavior if we aren't sure what that function is. And if we're assuming it's attention and we address it from that perspective and it's escape, we're not gonna have any effect on decreasing that behavior that we don't wanna see. Uh, so at the beginning, I mentioned the behavior is not good or bad. Um, it just is. For the purposes of this presentation, we're going to refer to behavior as either maladaptive or challenging so that we're all on the same page. So attention. Attention is when an individual behaves in a certain way that gets them focused attention from their peers, their parents, their teachers, anybody who's around them. An example could be the teacher asks a student to raise their hand and if they know, if they know their answer. One student begins waving his hand frantically and yelling out the answer until the teacher then tells them to stop shouting out the answer and wait to be called on. If the function of that child's behavior, that raising their hand and yelling out, is attention, they just received attention. Um, I had a supervisor at one point who used to say, negative attention is better than no attention. So it's important to remember that things like reprimands and you know, telling somebody to stop doing something or redirecting them is attention. And there's a time to still do all of those things. But if that behavior, the reason that they're engaging in something is attention, we wanna limit that kind of response. The third is access to tangibles. So um, your child's gonna behave in a certain way to get a preferred item or an access to a particular activity. Um, you know, I can, the example I use here is an individual cries and says, I want a cookie. And the parent says no, and they cry and whine more, and the parent ends up letting them have the cookie or additional food. What that child learned was crying and whining will get them what they want. Another example of this is a little bit more personal in my own family. Um, my children learned very young that if they kept asking their father over and over again to go do something or to buy them something, even though he said no the first time, if they asked multiple times, he would give in and say yes to make them stop. So they learned no didn't mean no, and to keep ask, asking him for those things. And then they got access to it. Sensory. So people who are behaving in certain behaviors for sensory reasons are doing that because it feels good to them, that behavior they're engaging in feels good, or it stops something from feeling badly. So scratching your skin to relieve an itch, we've all done some of that. We've gotten a mosquito bite, we've scratched it when it was itchy and it stopped. That's sensory. It could also be escape. So how do we go about determining the function of behavior? We take data and we take a lot of data. Um, so I want you guys to understand that when I'm talking about taking data, some of this is things that you guys will do as parents. A lot of it is going to be things that your support team is going to do, whether it's a behavior intervention specialist at your residential program, or you have a BCBA and an RBT on your team, they may do that. Um, in some states, they allow some behavioral support that's not licensed um, through those means to come in and assist. Uh, there's a lot of residential providers across the country who aren't using BCBAs in their programs, but are using other master's leveled trained professionals to perform these things. And the things they're taking data on are things like the setting events, which are those things that happen prior to the behavior, 
um, that might increase the likelihood of that behavior happening or access to that antecedent. An antecedent is what happens immediately before the behavior, the behavior itself, and then the consequence. The consequence is what happens immediately after the behavior. Now, sometimes we think of the consequence as punishment. So what was their consequence for doing X, Y, and Z? Well, they were grounded for two weeks. That's not exactly what we mean in these moments when we're talking about the ABCs of behavior. The consequence is what happens immediately after the behavior. We take ABC data. And this is something that you can do at home. So um, this is just a quick example of what that might look like, a data tracking sheet. Um, PWSA does have access to data tracking sheets that we can provide you if you do want to track some of what's happening at home and share it with your team. And you fill this out by writing down the setting event. And I think it's super important to really think about what those setting events are because they're really important for kids with PWS. Um, again, that antecedent is what happened directly before that target behavior. That behavior, that target behavior is observable behavior. So it's exactly what happened. And then the consequences, again, what happened directly after that target behavior occurred. So for example, um, the child woke up at 4.30 a.m. after a nightmare. The parent later in the day asks their child to put their toys away. And then the child starts picking at their lip. The parent says, stop picking. So the parent's immediate response of stop pick, telling them to stop picking happened right after the child started picking. That's why it's the consequence. Another example is school was canceled because of snow. So for those of you who live in the Northeast, um, this is happening right now. We had lots of snow in the last couple of days. Um, schools have been canceled or delayed. And as we know, for a lot of our kids, that change in routine can be problematic. So later in the day, the child was playing with his toys when a sister began playing with a nearby toy. This child then pulls his sister's hair. The sister yelling, ow, and crying is the consequence. So when we're looking at this data, we would look at it and say, okay, so this is what happened. What could the function, what's the reason they engaged in the behavior? In the example of the sister yelling out and crying, that's attention that the child just received. It could also be access to a tangible. So we need a little bit more information about this. But if that sister then put down that toy and the child was able to start playing with it, Perhaps they were looking for access to that toy. They didn't want their sister playing with it. If they just wanted their sister to provide some attention, pulling their hair got them to engage with them by yelling out and crying. We can also track data um, in a scatter plot. And this is something that I think we see in school systems pretty regularly. When we're trying to figure out, does behavior happen? at certain times. So what you would do here is put just put a check mark. If the behavior, the target behavior that you guys have identified as a team occurred, what day between what time? So for kids who are going to therapies or um, changing classes, these are really helpful to see if there's certain things happening at certain times that increase the likelihood. So they end up being that setting event for that child and they engage in behavior more frequently. Um, some tips for collecting the ABC data is to pay attention to antecedents such as demand, difficult tasks, transitions, um, being told no. So for us, when we talk about PW and addressing a lot of behaviors, that much of what we're doing is going to be on the antecedent. We want to prevent behavior, so we need to pay attention to those things. Um, and things that we may not realize are antecedents can be. So, you know, for uh, many kids with PWS, transitioning from one activity to another is problematic. Uh, being told no, that word no, can be very triggering for people. 
asking somebody to do anything, whether it's good or bad, something you're excited about, can still be a triggering event that ends up being that antecedent for a targeted behavior. Uh, pay attention to those consequences. So uh, repeating requests is one that I think is really important. And I think at least I have done this many, many times. So you tell your child, go put on your shoes and you wait a few seconds or minutes and they haven't and you go and you tell them again, please go put on your shoes. Now you're annoyed and the third time you're saying, just put on your shoes, I told you to put on your shoes. If your child is uh, looking for attention, if that's the function of the behavior, they're getting lots of attention with those repeated requests. Um, think about all of the times that I think every parent I know has said, it's just easier to do it myself. Forget it, I'll just do it. So when you've asked somebody to do something and they don't do it, and then you just do it yourself because it's easier, that consequence is them not having to do it. That could be an avoidance or an escape maintained behavior that they're engaging. Uh, for kids with PWS, we know that setting events are very important. So track setting events. Not all ABC data charts that you can find on the internet or that you get from your providers are going to include setting events. Uh, but for kids with PWS, we know that that setting event is really powerful. So I think for those of you who are either working with individuals with PWS or a parent and you're doing some of this data tracking, it's important that you include that in your documentation as well. You also need to collect multiple scenarios. So you're not going to be able to determine the function of your child's behavior after one incident. You need to see this happen multiple times to be able to evaluate that information. And that's the reason when you have different professionals coming into your home or into your classroom for observations, they come multiple days and at different times so that they can get a, a wide a range of data to then evaluate and analyze. So what are those setting events? It can be that your clothing just feels itchy. It can be that your family has recently moved. The temperature or the lighting in the room. So uh, the example I use is for me personally, I have difficulty with fluorescent lighting. Um, it can cause migraines, that sort of thing. So I know I am not my best when I'm in a, a setting, a, a room that has fluorescent light. Not getting enough sleep. Now think about kids with, and adults with PWS for a second. We know that many of them have sleep-related disorders as well, whether it's narcolepsy with or without cataplexy, um, sleep apnea, excessive daytime sleepiness. That's a setting event for these guys. Just not feeling well. Think about for yourself. When you're not feeling well, are you a little bit more irritable? Are you more likely to snap at someone? Are you more likely to say, no, just not going to do that? Or to get angry faster and say things that are hurtful or throw things, you know, whatever that may look like for you. And then changes to routines. This is a big one. So if you are somebody who really thrives in structure, you like to have everything planned out in advance, you need to know what's happening. And we know for a lot of kids with PWS, this is something that they do well with. Changes to that routine can be difficult for them when they're expecting one thing to happen and it doesn't. In schools, this is very common if there is a substitute teacher or it's a, a day that they normally have pull out for occupational therapy and the occupational therapist isn't there that day. That's a setting event. What we're gonna talk about now is antecedent intervention. And these are things that we can do to prevent interventions. And you're gonna hear from Patrice Carroll later on today. She's gonna to talk all about how prevention is key and you'll learn lots of preventative strategies there. So we're just gonna cover this very briefly. But preventative interventions can be creative scheduling, scheduling the least preferred activity after the most preferred, or I'm sorry, before the most preferred. So if you know that your child hates taking a shower, schedule the shower 
right before their evening snack. If you know that they do best in their physical therapy appointments earlier in the day, make sure physical therapy happens earlier in the day. So get creative with your scheduling when possible. Now, I understand that in schools, you don't necessarily have the option of choosing these things, but talk about it as part of your IEP meetings, about what works best for your child so they can get the best out of their schedule and their related services. Providing choices. This doesn't mean that you're letting your loved one choose whatever they want. It's providing choices that you're comfortable with. So if you're giving them some input and allowing choices around food, it might be that, do you want to have two ounces of chicken tonight or do you wanna have two ounces of fish? It's still something you're comfortable with, but they're getting to make that choice. They're having a little bit of ownership and feeling like they're in control when so much of the world for somebody with part of a relationship is controlled by somebody else. It can be around chores. Do you want to vacuum the floor today or do you want to sweep? They're still gonna do a chore, but they get to choose which one. Do you wanna wear a red jacket or a blue jacket? Again, providing choices that make them feel like they're in control but ultimately you still are satisfied with the outcome. And then preset, I cannot say this enough, help paint the picture for them. If you're going into a new environment or any environment really, tell them what to expect. What are they going to see? Who's going to be there? If you know there's going to be a change, tell them. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind that for some kids, telling them too far in advance can also be triggering. So this is something where you know your loved one's best. You know what that line is. You know, um, good things can also be triggered. So, you know, getting really excited about an upcoming vacation or a basketball game that they're going to tonight can be super exciting. But if somebody struggles with knowing this information too far in advance, what you might see happen is they get so excited about it happening that they are unable to control their body and their words and sometimes end up engaging in unsafe behavior or melting down right before the behavior because they've had too much time to think about it. So you know, know your loved ones well enough to know where that line is. Um, but overall, giving people a heads up, whether they have product release syndrome or not, is important. Helping people preset and knowing what to expect. Enrich the environment. So if you know your child does best and engages in skin picking less when they have fidgets to play with, make sure that there's fidgets around the house that they can play with. If you know that... Um, they really like vestibular motion. Have a swing in your backyard or little trampoline or um, those things that you sit on and spin. You know, have those things there for them to engage in before they start seeking that kind of sensory input in a maladaptive way. And then use their child, your child's interests. So I think this is something that I, I personally would love to see schools be able to do more frequently. So if um, somebody likes music and you're trying to teach them something, sing it. If they like music and you want them to brush their teeth longer, sing a song while they brush their teeth. Use their interests. If there's somebody who really likes to do puzzles and maybe they're struggling with counting, count the puzzle pieces as they do it. It'll feel less subversive to them and they'll be more likely to engage in that activity and learn what you're looking for. So the consequence or the reactive interventions are the things that I think most people know the most about. So reinforcement, extinction, and punishment, those are the three consequence interventions. So let's talk about reinforcement. Reinforcement is anything that increases the behavior from happening again. And that's the behavior we want to see. So it can be positive or it can be negative. If it's positive reinforcement, what you're doing is introducing something to the environment. And because you've done that, 
they're going to engage in that behavior you want to see more frequently. Negative reinforcement is when you remove something. So active avoidance and escape are types of negative reinforcement. And the way I like to explain this is, um, so for active avoidance, you're at a concert and they have that spotlight that goes around the arena and you can pretty much count the amount of seconds that it's gonna go around before it shines in your face again. Now, after it does it a couple of times, you anticipate it's coming and you put your hand up and it goes by. You've actively avoided that from happening. Escape is, an example could be, um, you're in your car. So a lot of the new cars, I think I'm dating myself here, uh, will have a sound that will beep until you put your seatbelt on. So putting your seatbelt on stops that aversive beeping. So you're more likely to put your seatbelt on so it doesn't happen. The, what you're removing from the environment is the beep. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, please put some questions in the, um, the Q&A and I'm happy to talk further about that. So examples of reinforcement, we'll talk about positive first. Uh, giving somebody praise and a high five. You've done such a great job. I'm so proud of you. Those are things that we see on a regular basis that kids with PW, kids and adults, I'm sorry, uh, anyone with PWS, I have found responds really well to these things. Offering them an activity. You did such a great job. Let's go do a puzzle together. Stickers. Um, cheering, you know, really making a big deal. Some kids really want to hug. So they're really proud of themselves. And the way that you can show them is by giving them a hug and telling them how proud you are of them. Negative reinforcement um, is, let's say the teacher says to the class, if you get a 90 or higher on this upcoming quiz, you won't have homework to do that night. What you're removing from the environment is the homework that hopefully will increase them getting 90s or above. So again, it's important to remember if it doesn't actually increase the behavior you want to see, it's not reinforcement. So when we say, you know, I've done the praise and I've given them a high five after they've done, you know, uh, making their bed, but it hasn't increased them making their bed, well, then that's not reinforcing for them. We need to look at something else that would be reinforcing. Another example of negative uh, reinforcement is one that I use on a regular basis. So uh, if traffic is really backed up and I go a separate way, it's because what had happened over time is I learned if I went through Mechanicville, there's less traffic and I can get to my office faster than if I went through Scamp. I removed the traffic and it increased how I get to work. Removing curfews and rules is something that we see um, for teenagers or young adults. You know, perhaps they're stay, they're able to stay out later at night, or um, they no longer have to do X, Y, and Z because they've been so trustworthy or whatever that might be. Examples of punishment. So punishment, again, just like uh, reinforcement can be positive and negative but it decreases the behavior. So the behavior in question that we don't want to occur will decrease, that's punishment. Examples of punishment can be getting pulled over. So sometimes you'll hear people say that getting a speeding ticket can be punishing. And for some people it can, um, but really what I have found is getting pulled over is what that positive punishment is. Because what happens is if I get pulled over in a particular spot, I am gonna slow down when I drive by that area every time. It doesn't mean that I slow down in all the other areas, but I do slow down where I got pulled over. Um, having to do extra chores. I think um, this is something that we as parents use on a regular basis. Uh, you know, if you, your chore is to empty the kitty litter Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you miss it on Monday. Well, now you have to do it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You've added an extra day. That's a positive punishment if it decreases them forgetting to do that chore in the first place. Reprimands can be punishment. Um, 
you know, verbally disciplining somebody if it decreases the behavior in question. Negative punishment is things like your teenage daughter. I think most teenage daughters have done this at point. They've been frustrated and they've slammed a bedroom door. And you take that bedroom door off. They can't slam that door anymore. Um, taking away cell phones, taking away video games or iPads. Those are pretty common examples of punishment that we see are decreasing the amount of time. So in school, somebody may be allowed to have, you know, earn 15 minutes of iPad time after completing a specific task. Let's say it took them longer to complete that task. It limits the amount of time that they're able to use that iPad or they engaged in a maladaptive or challenging behavior earlier in the day. And when they, it is iPad time, they decrease the amount of time rather than taking it away. Now, extinction. So extinction is when you stop reinforcing a problem behavior that's been previously reinforced. So an example of this is your child screams and cries when it's time to leave the park. Previously, what you've done when they've started to scream and cry is allow five more minutes or 10 more minutes or 30 minutes at the park. You don't actually make them leave. An extinction procedure would be picking up your child and leaving without giving them any response when they're screaming and crying when you tell them that it's time to leave. Some things to keep in mind with extinction. It gets worse before it gets better. So. This is a graph of charting the behavior in question. So the, the screaming and crying. And these first couple um, blue circles on the graph are prior to the extinction procedure being in place, put in place. So now after the third one, you change how you respond. You're going to, at that park when you tell them it's time to leave and they start screaming and crying, they don't want to go, you're going to immediately pick them up and you're going to leave. And now it's going to get worse for a little while. And this is the area where I start to see and hear from parents, it's not working. I'm not doing this anymore because it's not working. It gets worse. They, the screaming, crying may turn into also pulling your hair or biting you and kicking you as they're screaming and crying. If you stick with it, I promise it's going to get better and it's going to get better faster. This increase in intensity and frequency of that behavior is called an extinction burst. Um, you may hear somebody on your team use those words, and this is what they're referring to. But then what happens is, see how much that behavior decreased in intensity? All of those other three dots, in one term, it's gone down that far. And it only takes two to make that behavior go away completely. Now, when you tell them that it's time to go, they're done. They go just like you want them to, which is perfect. I recognize this is not easy. And depending on the scenario, it can be exhausting. It can be embarrassing. Um, and when we, we you know, talk with your team about when to put a particular behavior on extinction. Um, when can you feasibly do that? When can you have the emotional capacity to actually deal with that increase that's coming? If you can't, and it's okay if you can't, then you need to not do that because it's not going to make a positive difference for you or for your loved one. And I know we went through this really quickly. I do see a few questions. We have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, and then let me just show you our last slide. If anybody doesn't have our contact information, um, here is where it is, our website, the info at PWSA. And then you can call 941-312-0400 24 hours a day for those emergent situations. We do have after hours staff available on the family support team um, when you're dealing with some of these things. So please feel free to give us a call. Uh, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can look at some of the questions. 
Um, so Sarah says, from a DSP perspective, adding extra chores because of behavior is considered punishment and prohibited procedure. You are absolutely right. So in um, most residential situations, what you'll find is you cannot force somebody to do chores at all. Um, and the reason for that is if I go home as an adult who doesn't live in a group home or a residential situation, if I don't feel like vacuuming today, I don't have to. Nobody's going to make me. And that's the same philosophy in the residential world, um, that you can't use that. But there are some other things. Quite honestly, people with PWS respond much, much better to reinforcement than they do punishment anyway. Um, very often, they have a hard time making the connection between what that punishment is or that consequence and the behavior. So it doesn't end up having the effect that we're looking for to be effective for them. And then can I send you the PowerPoint presentations to use for reference? So what we're going to do is at the end of this presentation, um, because it is being recorded, we will take the recording and it's going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, and I believe that link will also be on our website on the same registration page that you went to to register for the event today. Um, a copy of the recordings will be there as well. Uh, the PowerPoint itself won't be uploaded, but the presentation will be. Are there other questions? I know that we went through this very quickly. Um, when a student with PWD is actively engaging in self-harm action scratching, what is the most appropriate intervention? That's a great question. So I'm not going to get too much into the picking um, because it's going to be addressed later today. Um, it's also going to be addressed at our conference by Casey Bedard, uh, who is a BCBA and working specifically with um, people who are engaging in picking. But we always want to address safety first. So if they are um, in a situation where they are harming themselves, you do want to do things to help them decrease that, whether it's using some response blocking, which could be putting your hand over theirs, um, you know, giving it as little attention. So it really does come down to why are they engaging in the skin picking and the self-harm? Is it attention seeking? Is it a sensory reason. Whatever you put in place to stop that behavior, that replacement behavior has to have the same function. So if they're engaging in skin picking for a sensory reason, and we give them lots and lots of, um, if we, they're doing it for sensory, we give them lots and lots of attention. Uh, you know, we give them things to play with and we're talking to them and we're trying to engage them. And what they're not getting is that same sensory function. They're still going to pick. Um, for Nancy, yes, I agree. The, most of the folks that I have worked with over the years with credit release syndrome, they also don't learn very well from the consequences. Um, how do you know if an entity or a group home is capable of doing it? what you describe. Sometimes I get a deer in the headlights look. Very true. So quite honestly, there's lots of group homes that really are not well-versed in part of release syndrome. Uh, they may support one individual or just a handful, and they approach their supports from the perspective of everyone else with a developmental disability. Um, what I would suggest is really looking at, are they willing to learn? Is there a champion? who will help them? Who are their behavior team? Do they have one or is it consultant? How often are they training? Um, those are some of the things that you wanna find out from them. If they're willing to engage in some training, please share their information with us, share our information with them. We are happy to provide additional training and support to residential providers. Um, part of our mission here at PWS it, a, is to support everyone and empower everyone. Um, so that the individual with Prada Willis syndrome has a better quality of life. So that means anybody who touches their lives, including the providers, we are here to help support so it has a positive impact on that person that they're supporting. 
um, bars. Some of the examples of negative reinforcement can also be positive. Okay, so that's a great question. So the way to look at it is um, positive reinforcement is putting something into the environment. You're adding something. Negative is you're removing a stimulus or you're decreasing the, in the intensity of that stimulus. So that high five, you're adding something. Removing the iPad is removing a stimulus. Does that make sense? Uh, working in a residential setting with adults that initially sabotage positive reinforcement. Um, I think I need to know a little bit more about what you mean by sabotage the, um, the reinforcement. In what way? So I would say if the reinforcement isn't, the reinforcement that you're providing isn't working, then it's not actually reinforcement. It's just a stimulus that you've provided to that environment. Um, in order for it to actually be reinforcing, it means that it has to increase the behavior. If you want to add a little bit more to that, Krista, I'm happy to answer better than that. Uh, my daughter is 18 years old. What strategies can you use for sit-down strikes that can last hours? This is one of my favorites. So, um, for, again, everything goes back to buyer they do it. Um, but I tend to wait out a sit-down strike. If there is no harm happening, we just wait it out. Um, and this can be really challenging in situations where perhaps you're in a, a store or in a parking lot um, and you need to move on to something else. If it is about attention, providing no attention. You really, I, I find a lot of sit-down strikes happen because somebody's either disappointed or they're just overwhelmed in that environment. Removing a lot of that stimuli, rem <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, removing any stimuli, walking away for a little bit, making sure that your body language is neutral. So it's important to keep in mind that um, your body language, how your tone of voice, the way that you're moving, the way you're standing can have an impact on the behavior. Just looking at somebody can be reinforcing for them if the function of that behavior is attention. Um, and if your child is little enough that you can pick them up and take them wherever you need to go, in some cases, you can do that. Um, it, it sometimes reinforces that behavior, though. So it's really figuring out why are they engaging in that sit-down strike in the first place. Um, I am on here with a mom of a daughter with PWS. That's great. Thank you for being here, Angela. Um, strategies for a mom and dad. When the behaviors have gotten so out of control, how do we as parents control our behaviors towards the child when it's so triggering for us? This is such a valid question. And I think it's important for you to understand this is normal. Your response, your, your internal response is absolutely normal. It's okay to just walk away, to give yourself a timeout, um, to regroup. When it has gotten so out of control, it's very hard and it takes a lot of time to get things back under control. And that's where you need to bring in some experts to help you with that. Um, you can call us. I know Casey and Cin well, Cindy's going to talk about schools um, and Patrice is going to talk about preventing them. But Casey's going to talk a lot about that aggressive and tantruming behavior. And I think she'll have some tips for you as well. Uh, but when it comes to your own stuff, please you know, reach out and call us. We're here to just listen to you vent sometimes too, but I think it's important. People feel a lot of shame around those feelings and you shouldn't. It's absolutely normal to feel that frustration and the rage in yourself when things are so out of control. You're frustrated, you're exhausted. And in some cases, uh, perhaps you've been harmed in the course of an incident. So now you're feeling a little resentment and in some cases just done. You wanna be done. Um, that's all completely okay. You know, please give us a call and we can help with that. My 35 year old son is being preyed on by two impaired individuals that have no supervision and they're telling him his family is against him. That's awful. I'm so sorry. 
Uh, they can get on food and a girlfriend or they can see the home handlers and it's something they would like. His behavior has been very divisive since he talks to them, my husband and staff have someone with him 24 hours a day is damaged dramatically. We be worried and let up in the world. So what you're saying is um, you're concerned about the two individuals who are now preying on your son and you're worried if you let up on the supervision that those two individuals will return and continue to pray on your son. Um, so I think there's a couple things that we need to do here. If your son is being supported by an, an outside agency, we just need to make sure that they're aware. Um, and disability rights, departments of human services, um, some of these organizations, and they have different names in every state, can also help um, with this process. Your son being um, preyed on, taken advantage of by two other individuals can be a situation where you want to have adult protective services get involved and provide some additional support as well. Um, if you want to give me a call, we can talk a little bit further about those specifics that are happening and see what we can put in place. Um, I think the increased supervision is one of the best because that the supervision that is there is going to be that barrier to the other two taking advantage of your son in the meantime. But we want to you know, help your son also gain the skills to not be taken advantage of. So teaching him some other appropriate advocacy skills and risk um, identification. So it, very often um, individuals with PWS are just very loving and they want friends so badly that they're willing to tolerate behavior that the rest of us would not from other people. So helping them learn those skills to not tolerate that behavior is something that should be part of that package of how we support them as well. Um, where to start with presenting child's behavior issues with the school, helping the school understand the seriousness of PWS, as well as the fact that PWS behavior is not handled the same way um, as autism prior to an FBA. So prior to the FBA, what I, and for those of you who don't know, an FBA is a functional behavior assessment. And that's what you use to really find out the function of that behavior. So it's, um, many of you have probably participated in it. Uh, the school or the, the behaviorist on your team is calling and interviewing you. They're observing your child and taking data. They might be having you complete assessments. That's all part of the FBA. Um, so what you wanna do prior, if your child is in school, have PWS training written into their IEP. Make it mandatory that every single year, everyone on their team has to participate in a PWS specific training. Um, selfishly, I'd like to say by us, but it doesn't necessarily need to be by PWSA. It needs to be by someone who understands the complexity of PWS, understands the responsibilities legally of the school district and understands the behavior uh, piece and that behavioral phenotype of individuals with PWS. But what you want to do is really um, build it in so there's the training and you're talking about it constantly. So data can be taken even prior to the FBA. So if your child, depending on what that behavior looks like, so a lot of schools will focus on the food seeking behavior only, but we may see things like perseveration or melting down because the schedule has changed or not knowing what to expect. Um, really helping them understand why that is happening and taking data right from the start on those things will help also determine whether or not an FBA even needs to be completed or if we can just put some strategies in place like a visual calendar on their desk to help them understand what's happening um, and know their schedule. Those are all things that you can do prior to needing an FBA. Um, does helping independence with does helping independence with common skills a good reinforcement? Give them attention when they state they're ready for it. Natural consequences from my perspective, individuals learn best. Um, so yes, I think it, once somebody is calm enough to engage in those coping skills, talking them through it can be really, really helpful. Um, what I would not do is if somebody is in what we have um, termed, you know, that PWS rage, where they're really physically and emotionally out of control and not aware of what they're doing anymore, you're not going to be able to talk with them at that point. That's not when you want to start to engage in 
be, you know, please use your coping skills. Um, try this, try that. They can't hear you in that moment. But if they're calm, you want to work through that. And then, you know, there's other times I have not found rehashing the behavior later to be very helpful. Um, but what you can do is use social stories to present how you expect somebody to behave in the future with those coping skills. Um, so it's a little bit less um, attacking or feeling like they're being attacked for that behavior. I have sat it out for up to four hours, rain or shine. I've given no attention within those hours, no words to or even contact, and they still stuck it out in the um, the meltdown. Yeah, that's tough. I, I, I've been there with you for several hours during a, a shutdown. Um, I think we want to find out why they're engaging in that shutdown and address it from that perspective. Barb, this is a great tip. If you can tag team when your loved one or the person you're supporting is engaging in a maladaptive behavior, it really helps you um, walk away and regroup while somebody else deals with it for a little bit. Providers do this a lot where you tag out and just say, you know, I know that either my tone of voice or my body language is no longer effective in managing this situation. Um, a, attention or not given something. I'm sorry, Angela, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, how can we give treat? How can we give treat a four-year-old PWS boy who doesn't usually feel comfortable in new places? Uh, so what I think that you're asking is how can you help the four-year-old who doesn't feel uncomfortable in new places? So this is where maybe pre-setting can be really helpful and helping them understand up front what is going to happen, who is going to be there, what it's going to look like. Um, what they can do while they're there if they're feeling uncomfortable. Uh, for a lot of our, our a lot of your kids, um, sensory things can be very common, calming. So bringing something with them as they go into an environment that has helped them stay calm, whether it's something that's tactile or fidget spinner, or um, if they respond really well to kind of that touch, you know, offering proactively some of those deep hugs when they're in a new environment may help them stay a little bit calmer. I would also shorten the time that you're there and gradually increase the time in new environments. Sometimes you really have no control over that, but if you do, um, you, you're going to want to do that to help them become more comfortable. Um, Larry, so we will be um, putting the recordings on both our YouTube channel, and there'll be a link on our website. And then I will be, um, once the recording is ready, I'm going to email the link to everyone who registered. So you will have a copy of it and can access it that way as well. Uh, does the problematic behavior increase as they grow? Or if we train them properly, it will decrease? No, this is a really good question. Um, I think this is individualized for people. So um, I am a strong proponent of putting a lot of proactive antecedent strategies in place upfront from very early age to prevent behaviors from happening. Um, in my experience, I think um, it does get a little bit harder as people get older. And that's a couple of reasons. I think that that's the case in the general population as well. Um, you know, when you think of you know, little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems, that goes for everybody. Um, as our kids get older, they become, in many cases, more vocal, more stubborn, um, stronger. So some of those, you know, tantrum room behavior where if they, you know, kicked you in the shin at two, isn't the same as kicking you when they're 17. You know, it, it feels a little bit different. Um, I don't want to promise that it will prevent all behavior. Um, but I do think that what we talk about today and implementing these things consistently will decrease behavior overall. Um, and individuals will recover quicker from behavior. 
Uh, one of the consequences and actually antecedents um, that we did not talk about today is empathy. And I think this is something that is so important for everyone, not just our individuals with Prada Willie syndrome, but um, you know, sometimes it just sucks for them. You know, they're frustrated. They want to go play with the neighbor and the neighbor's not home, or they thought that the neighbor was going to be home because on the bus they said they were going to be. And when they got home, the neighbor didn't know that mom and dad were taking them somewhere. And now little Johnny isn't able to go play and he's frustrated and he's mad and uh, perhaps throws something or says something. Um, it's okay. And you should empathize and validate those emotions. What I think people think empathy means is validating and accepting the behavior. And it doesn't. It's really about accept, acknowledging those feelings. And we all have big feelings at some point in our lives, some of us more frequently than others. We all know what it's like to be disappointed. We all know what it's like to be angry. Um, empathize with them. They're feeling those same things too. And for some kids, they have a hard time articulating. That's what they're feeling. So if you recognize that perhaps somebody's feeling frustrated or they're sad, help name that behavior for them and use that empathy proactively to prevent it from becoming something much larger, if you can. We have just a couple more questions here. Um, how would you handle the possibility of an observer being a setting event and collecting good data? So this is a great question. Um, reactivity. So this happens to me all the time. I go into schools and I observe and collect data. When I, just last week I was at the school district and I walked in, one of the students said, you're here for me, right? He had a fantastic day. There was no challenging or maladaptive behavior he emitted. Um, he was responding to my presence, um, knowing that I was, you know, writing down and tracking uh, what he was doing. This is super common. And there's a couple ways to um, look at that. So if you can have a situation where you know, the person you're collecting data on isn't able to see you. One of the schools that I observe has an observation room with the two-way mirror. It's amazing. Uh, I'm able to get some really great data there. It's the only school that I've ever seen that in. And that's obviously something that's much, much harder to put in place in your home or in a residential facility as well. Um, having the person who's collecting data come around more frequently will also help. They just become part of the environment. They're there. It's not such a shock to have an outsider there. That will help lessen that reactivity as well. Many times over the years, um, it got better, but sometimes he just loses it. In Victor's words, it can be food or changes in schedules, but sometimes he's just frustrated. Those are his words, not mine. I think that's a great point, Tammy. I think that um, people get frustrated and they have a really hard time articulating it and using those coping skills when they're frustrated. And it's um, helpful for all of us who are supporting folks to recognize what those frustrating events might be and do some of that presetting and reminding people to use their coping skills prior to getting frustrated. It's never going to be 100% perfect. Um, you know, we're all evil to articulate our, our feelings and um, have the, the skill set and coping skills to behave appropriately. And we don't all the time. So it, it, I'm not promising perfection here. Um, that's not realistic. But I do think that if we start looking at this from their point of view and things that we know might be frustrating or triggering for them and adding a little extra support then, to help them get through it, we'll see less of that kind of just losing it that you explained. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll give it just one more minute. Thank you guys, this was really great. You had some really, really great questions. And I hope that um, the next three presentations, Patrice talking about uh, preventing behaviors, um, thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. Uh, after that, we'll be Casey talking about, you know, ah, preventing tantruming, 
managing tantruming when it's happening, and also how to manage yourself in those moments. And then Cindy is going to end our day talking about that FBA, that functional behavior assessment in the school system, and what that looks like, what your role is as the parent of a student, um, and how sometimes that's different than what an FBA looks like when it's being done at home um, or in a residential setting.